Inflated text is cool and fun, and you can learn how to do it in Blender using geometry nodes right now. There are two main steps. First, creating the 3D text, and second, simulating it. Starting with any text, convert it to a curve, fill the curve, extrude it, and remesh it. After that, we simulate it by moving every point a little bit each frame, trying to make every point stay within a certain distance from the other point it's connected to, update its velocity based on its start and end position, and use the velocity along with any added forces to update its position in the next frame. This process runs in a loop and creates our animation. For each point to stay within a certain distance from its neighbor points, we need each point to store a reference to each of its neighbors as well as the target distance it tries to stay within. We store this information between remeshing and simulation in an initialization phase. In this step, we'll also identify which points we want to pin so that they don't move at all. After we're happy with our simulation, we'll set up lighting and create a material using some attributes we created along the way. The blend file is available through a link in the description, so check that out if you'd like, and let's get into it. Here's our input string that comes from the modifier, and here is the node group for remeshing. If this looks like a lot of nodes, that's because it is. If you'd like to remesh your text in a simpler way, you can do it like this. This little group converts the string to a curve, fills it, extrudes it, and remeshes it using volume nodes. This is all well and good, but you end up with wonky edges, and the grid pattern doesn't produce as nice as an animation as it could. Instead, we'll remesh the text with a method that is careful to preserve sharp features, and creates a triangulated mesh where all the vertices are packed together to create a more realistic animation. There's a lot to learn in this network, so let's start with converting the text to a curve. Since the string to curve node outputs curve instances, we'll pop in a realize instances node to make the curves real. If you take a look at the points on the curve, they aren't evenly spaced out. For our simulation, we need our edges to be close to the same length, so let's resample the curve using the length setting. The only issue with this is that the corners won't necessarily get their own point after the resample, which sort of rounds them out. We preserve these corners by separating the curve based on corner points before resampling. This way, each corner corresponds to an endpoint, which are unaffected by the resample operation. Now we need to convert our resampled curve into a 3D mesh, and UV unwrap it into 2D space for point distribution and triangulation. We'll be using the edges formed by extruding from our corner points as seams for unwrapping. So we'll store an isCorner attribute according to which vertices in our mesh have only one neighbor. We'll then join our corner endpoints so that we can fill our geometry with faces. If we don't have any corners because the input text is a zero or something similar, we need to add them or the unwrapping operation may have overlapping geometry which corrupts the triangulation. Each separate part of the curve needs at least one corner. So we iterate through each mesh island, detect whether or not the island has an existing corner, and if it doesn't, we mark the first point in the island as a corner. Before we extrude our text, we need to fill it with faces. This works by converting back to a curve and using the fill curve node. We lose our is corner attributes in this process, so we need to retrieve them by sampling the closest point before conversion. We use the sample nearest and sample index node for this, piping in the is corner attribute into the value socket of the sample index node and setting the output as the is corner attribute of our filled curve mesh. Our next step is extrusion. We use a repeat zone because we want to make sure the edges of our unwrapped mesh are evenly spaced in the same way as our original text curve. Without this, we'll end up with long edges at the corners of our final mesh. We extrude by a resample size each iteration and determine the number of iterations by dividing our desired text depth by our resample size. Then we add our original mesh back in, but flip its faces so that all of our normals point outwards. We merge vertices to unify the mesh and move on to unwrapping. This first set of nodes determines which edges should be used as seams for the unwrapping operation, and then captures that as a boolean attribute so we can use it after changes to the geometry. Here you can see a visualization of all the edges where this boolean is true. This consists of edges that are derived from the isCorner attribute we derived earlier, edges with an angle greater than 89 degrees, and edges that are not quote-unquote inner edges. The inner edge condition comes from the edge cases where the curve to mesh node creates edges internal to the text face that connects two corners. In this case, the inner edge would be marked as a seam, but we want to maintain unbroken text faces in our unwrap, so we exclude any edges that aren't in the same location as the original text boundary curve when squished into the ground plane. We use the output of the capture attribute node to split mesh edges. This will allow the UV unwrap node to calculate 2D UV coordinates for the separated parts of the mesh. We store an original position attribute so that we can remap the mesh into 3D after triangulation, and then use the UV unwrap node to create a UV attribute. 
Then we set the position of each vertex to its UV location. Now we'll create a nice triangulation by randomly distributing points on our 2D mesh, relaxing those points so that they are more evenly spaced, and using constrained Delaunay triangulation to create a mesh from those points and the boundaries of the mesh. First, we need to select the 2D mesh boundaries. Since these correspond to our unwrap seams, we can use the Boolean attribute we captured previously as a selection input to a separate geometry node set to edge. Then we can convert these to boundary points that will be pinned during the relaxation operation so that the boundary points are maintained while fill points are relaxed. The fill points are created by randomly distributing points on the faces of our original 2D mesh. We do a bit of math here to estimate a good density value based on our resample size and fill multiplier, but we can also unplug that and just use the density value directly. Next, we join the fill points with the boundary points and relax the fill points using a repeat zone. In each iteration, the fill points are pushed away from the fill or boundary point that is closest to it. Each point is also set to the closest position on the original 2D mesh so that if it ends up outside the mesh, it's put back inside. After some number of iterations, here we use 80, the points find a more even spacing. Before triangulation, we delete points that are close to the boundary of the 2D mesh. This is because the constrained Delaunay triangulation algorithm takes in the boundary as input and uses its points in the triangulation as well, so points close to it are redundant. You might be wondering why we don't just remove the pin points and call it a day, but that's because some fill points can end up close to the boundary as well, and we'd like to remove those too. Next, we perform constrained Delaunay triangulation. But wait a minute, this looks like a pretty simple setup. What about your last video, Sean, where you did Delaunay triangulation in a much more complicated way and roundabout way? Well, little did I know that the fill curve node performs Delaunay triangulation under the hood. So if you don't want to know how the algorithm works and just want it to happen fast, this is the way to go. For this technique to work, we need our input to be a curve. So we convert our points to curves based on their unique ID so that each point is its own separate curve, and then join it with our 2D text boundary curve. Then we just pop that into the fill curve node set to triangles, and poof, magic. We'll want to use our UV coordinates in our material later on, so we'll want to transfer them to our new mesh because the points we created for triangulation don't have any UV attribute associated with them yet. So we renamed the UV attribute to text chord because the UV name is a special attribute name in Shaderland and it won't work if we try to use that one. We use another sample near surface node to get the original 3D position of all our newly created vertices and set their position to that. And finally, we have our beautifully remeshed text with corners preserved. Now for simulation. Every frame of the simulation will move the vertices of our mesh based on their velocity, and then try to find an arrangement where each vertex is within a target distance from each of its neighbors. In order for this to work, we need to know the neighbors of each point, as well as a target distance for each of them. We collect this information before the simulation loop in the store neighbors node group. In that group, we store up to six neighbors, which is the maximum number of neighbors a vertex in this mesh has. We can check that using an attribute statistic node and the spreadsheet view. Since a neighbor is defined as a vertex connected to the current vertex by an edge, we store different neighbors based on an edge index. We also supply a neighbor name so that we can store and retrieve attributes easily. In the store neighbor of edge node group, we get the overall index of the edge according to the relative edge index. The overall edge index is the index of the edge in the entire mesh, whereas the relative index or sort index is the index of the edge with respect to the current vertex. Then we sample both vertices of the resulting edge and select the vertex index that is not the current vertex index that we are finding neighbors for. Since some vertices have fewer than six neighbors, we might be attempting to store an attribute for a neighbor that doesn't exist. We can check this by comparing the edge index to the total number of edges connected to the vertex. If the edge index is greater than or equal to the total, then this neighbor doesn't exist, and we store negative 1 for the neighbor index and 0 for the target distance. If the neighbor does exist, we store its index as an integer attribute with our neighbor name input. The target distance is stored as the current distance between the two points, scaled up by a small amount. This scaling creates the desired wrinkling effect in the final simulation. Without it, our inflation is too boring. We create the attribute name for the target distance by adding an underscore dist string to the neighbor name input. After storing neighbor information, we mark edge vertices as pinned and keep these still during the simulation. We also store the original position for use in our material later on. This bake note is used so that if we use a small resample size, we can cache our remeshed text so that we don't risk having to wait for it to recalculate. 
So just set the bake node to still and press bake when the text is ready. Next, we set up a simulation zone with a nested repeat zone set to four steps. The higher the iteration count, the faster the final speed of the animation, but the slower the simulation time. In our simulation step group, we store the position of each vertex in an attribute named last position, set the position of each vertex as its current position plus its velocity, apply pressure by moving each non-pinned vertex along its normal vector by a small amount, iteratively apply distance constraints, and use a simple algorithm to prevent the cloth from colliding itself. Then we update the velocity of each vertex by subtracting the last position attribute we stored in the first step with the new vertex position. This is how you store the last position for each vertex. This is how you add the velocity vector to the position of each vertex. And then this is how you apply pressure to each vertex. We apply constraints 32 times. You can adjust this iteration count to your liking. Each apply constraint step generates a distance constraint correction vector for each vertex and applies it as an offset to the vertex position. The correction vector is obtained by averaging the correction vectors of all the neighbor vertices that we stored before simulation. To get the correction vector for each neighbor, we first extract the index of the neighbor vertex and its target distance from the current particle. To do this, we use the names of the attributes we stored during initialization. The neighbor name we supply in the input to this node group is the attribute name for the neighbor index, and the target distance is the same name with underscore dist appended. We then sample the neighbor index position and compare it with the position of the current particle. The correction vector points from the current position towards the neighbor position and has a scale calculated as the difference between the current distance to the neighbor particle and the target distance. If the neighbor index is negative one, it means that there is no neighbor belonging to the supplied attribute name. And in this case, the correction vector is scaled by zero, so it has no effect on the average. We also need the neighbor exists output in order to determine how many neighbors there are for calculating the average. We then add up all the correction vectors and get the total number of neighbors to obtain the average by dividing the vector sum by the total number of neighbors. After applying the constraints, we do a simple ray cast to avoid collisions. The ray origin is the current position plus a very small normal vector, and the ray direction is the normal vector. We set the ray length to a small value, in this case 0.01, so that collisions only happen in that range. If there is a collision, the particle's position is reset to its position at the beginning of the simulation step, which also means that its velocity will be set to zero in the update velocity node group. Here, we subtract the last position from the current position and scale the resulting vector by a slightly smaller amount than one to introduce some damping, which is also known as calming down the simulation. The resulting vector is stored as the velocity attribute and we begin the simulation loop again. We have this setup here to skip simulation if the scene frame is not within the range specified in our modifier. We also switch to empty geometry if the frame is not within this range. Here we have another bake node, this time set to animation so that we can cache the simulation if desired. Then we set the material to our material using a set material node and we are done with geometry nodes. So now if we switch into shader nodes, we can look at our little shader network. Now I've got uh, the view set so you're only seeing the inflated text object and you can use the forward slash on your keyboard to toggle between that. So just toggle that off so you can see the rest of the things in the scene. Press zero on the numpad to go into the camera view. I'm gonna go shift alt Z to turn off all of the overlays. You can also do that with this button up here and you can see the material. And so we've got a couple of components here. So for the color, We've got this color, which is based off of this uh, Verona, Voronoi texture, Veroni, Voronoi, uh, set to smooth F1, four dimensional, uh, it could be three dimensional, but I have it four dimensional. And we're using the original position attribute as the input. And the original position is just the position of the geometry before the simulation started. So just after the remeshing, like we set in the geometry nodes. And what we're doing here is we're just taking that color of the Voronoi texture, which right out of the box will just look like this. That looks pretty nice too, we could probably just use that. But instead I'm going to pipe that through a separate color node so that I can then separate its hue, saturation, and value, um, and pipe that into a hue, saturation, value node so that I can make the saturation more saturated. I don't want it just to be one because that's way too intense. 
So instead, I'm using this mix node in between the uh, original saturation and full saturation. And I just put that as 0.75 because I like the way that looks. And we're just setting the value to 1. So if I um, use the original value, you'd get something different. But I'm just setting that to 1. And I'm starting at this pink color uh, because that's, that's what I liked when I was testing out different colors to start from. You can control C and control V on top of that field in order to copy and paste it. So that's the base color. And then the roughness is just going to be all these little dots. So the way that we do that is we use another Voronoi texture node, set to smooth with the following settings. You can see those there. Again, we're using the original position as input. So you see like throughout the animation, you know, they stick to one position and um, nothing weird happens. So looks good that way. Um, so if that's just the raw input, you'll see sort of these smooth dots. And we still want some smoothness to them, but we want to reduce that a bit. So we're using this float curve node um, with this curve. So sort of like uh, moving this forward will bring more black into it. So things below zero. And then we're just smoothing this off as you go from zero to one. And then we're using a mix node between that output and zero, uh, just to make it a little bit less bright, I guess. I don't know. I probably just did this because I was uh, messing with it and I wanted to see what it ultimately would look like. Yeah. So if it's a zero, yeah, it's just too much. So I go to because like zero is nothing. So I just, I'm just. Um, I'm just using this mix node to to tune the output. And then I'm clamping the factor um, just to make sure that the values are between 0 and 1. Because sometimes if you have values outside of the 0, one, 0 to 1 range in shader nodes, it can get a little weird. And then lastly, here, let's just play the simulation. So lastly, we add dis, uh, toot, 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 some displacements. So you'll see without displacement, it looks like this. If I zoom in, you can really see it. Let's go over here. And with displacement, it looks like that. So it's sort of this uh, cross-hatched displacement pattern. And the way that we get that is with this series of nodes. It starts with the um, texture coordinate attribute that we mentioned in geometry nodes. And so right out of the box, uh, let's do the vector. That looks like this. So this is sort of the 2D UV coordinates of the text. And we're just going to scale that because um, we want this pattern to be much smaller. And the pattern is created with a sine wave and a cosine wave. So we're separating that text chord vector out into its x and y components. We're taking the sine of the x component and the cosine of the y component, and we're just multiplying those together. And that becomes the height input of our displacement node. And so, yeah, like let's do so. The sine of x is going to look like this. Um, scaling the text chord vector makes these lines bigger or smaller. So if it's like one, they're really big. And as you get bigger, they get smaller, 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 smaller. And I have it set to 3,000. Same with the cosine. And it's just um, horizontal rather than vertical because we're using the y component instead of the x component. And then when you multiply them together, you get these little soft squares. You could clamp that too. Um, but I'm not. And I'm just going to keep it that way because, I don't know, does it change things? It does change things. Yeah, definitely going to leave that unclamped because I like the negative value there. So very important. So that is our material. For the lighting and everything, we've got this ground plane back here. This is just set to a super simple diffuse BSDF with a, a color that we've tuned to this blue that we like. And our lighting just has these three sunlights. Um, if you look on this side over here, you can see the different settings. The strength and the angle are really the two important ones. The angle will control the softness of the light. Um, the strength, uh, the brightness, and then you know the angle of the light in this view uh, determines the direction that it's coming from. So these are the three lights. They're various settings. 
And that just about covers it. Well, I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you learned something. And above all, I hope you had fun. Until next time. Bye.